start and let the stragglers come in as they do. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jackie Mathis, Assistant Professor of Biological Sciences at Wellesley College in Massachusetts. Um, worked on and off with Jackie for years, so uh, this is her first time to Madison, so it's been great to have her here. Our lives have intersected in a number of different things, both in flux towers and in models. And today we'll talk about something that I know the least about, which is insects, so I'm kind of excited to see uh, what you've gone into since then. By way of background, um, she uh, did her bachelor's degree at Harvard. Uh, which is a school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, if you haven't heard of it. It's in environmental science and public policy. And her PhD, she worked with uh, Professor Dennis Beldaki at the University of California Berkeley uh, in the environmental science policy management uh, division. Uh, afterwards, she, uh, she uh, completed a, uh, she was a postdoc at Boston University, which is, I think, when we into the modeling world. Then joined the faculty at Dartmouth College prior to joining the faculty at Wellesley. Um, she has a broad background in, in ecosystem atmosphere interactions and in climate. And today we'll be hearing about putting bugs into models, forecasting ecosystem impacts of insects and pathogens. And just by way of announcements, we uh, are continuing our tradition of doing a post-seminar reception across at the set, starting around 4:45 or however quickly we can get across the street. Uh, please do come. There's cheese and crackers and beer, and we'll hang out there. Uh, we do have a spot or two if you wanted to join later in the evening for dinner instead. Uh, just let me know. There's the two of us are going right now. Um, and with that, we'll continue the seminar. We have three more CPEP seminars this semester. Uh, next week, we'll hear from uh, Susie Wiesner, who is here in UW Madison at ARS. And so we'll continue our evening looking at ecosystems and agriculture and a variety of things. So look forward to that. And feel free to Ask clarifying questions along the way, uh, save big questions for the end, and we prefer or try to want to get questions started off by a PhD or by students or early career scientists first, so preferably, but we'll see how that goes. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Um, thanks for the kind introduction and for the invitation to um, come to Madison for my first time. It's been a great visit so far, and thank you all for being here today. Um, and for the chance to share some of my research with you all on putting bugs into models. And so um, I want to start by acknowledging uh, some of my collaborators on this work. Uh, my collaborator Val Pascarella at Boston University um, worked on a lot of the remote sensing imagery analysis that I'll present today. Um, and then two undergraduate students um, from Wellesley College, Sarah Russell, who graduated a few years ago, and Sarah Smith Tripp, um, who graduated this past year, and both of um, them were really uh, instrumental in um, helping this, this research move forward, and I'll sort of highlight the pieces that they worked on as we come to them. And so um, forests and sex and pathogens represent a major source of disturbance within ecosystems. We think of um, herbivory as probably the most ubiquitous, widespread, sometimes the most important disturbance um, to net primary productivity within forests. Herbivores are everywhere within forests. And when we think about um, the importance of herbivores in the carbon cycle, um, we know that the ecosystem carbon cycle is really important for taking up atmospheric carbon dioxide. So um, atmospheric carbon has been increasing, but um, terrestrial ecosystems in particular have been taking up uh, large amounts of this fossil fuel um, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty, and in particular interactions with disturbances um, from climate change and other um, sort of indirect impacts from biotic disturbances um, that make the, the future of this terrestrial um, carbon sink uncertain. So that's where um, sort of forest insects and pathogens fit in, is thinking about these um, complex uncertainties uh, in the future of the terrestrial carbon sink uh, with interactions with climate change. And so when we think about forest insects and pathogens, these have spread um, really quickly globally through human shipping networks. And so we had this huge physical reconnection of the continents um, through our human shipping networks that some scientists have called the new Pangea. So this reconnection um, of, the, of the continents where organisms are moving among ecosystems and being introduced to new ecosystems where they've been formally um, geologically separated in evolutionary time. And so we think about forest insects and pathogens, they're along for the ride um, through these human shipping networks. And it's impossible to control the introduction of new insects through these shipping networks due to the, the sheer volume of trade 
that happens um, across the continents. And so when we think about um, introduced forest insects and pathogens, the northeastern U.S. is really a hot spot for these introduced forest pests. Um, due to the volume of trade that happens along the ports here, and due to the, the composition of the temperate forests within this region as well, they're host to a wide range of introduced um, forest pest um, insects. And so when we think about these forest insects and pathogens, they have huge um, economic costs for, um, for uh, local governments, they cost about $1.7 billion a year in cost to local governments and $830 million a year in lost residential property values. So you can really appreciate in this sort of before and after shot from an area near um, Worcester, Massachusetts, um, before the emerald ash borer, an introduced insect um, hit, and then afterwards where, where all of these street trees are gone. Um, they had to be cut after the, the beetle um, killed the trees and they had to remove the, the, the dead trees from the street. And so um, these also have large economic costs as well as ecological costs um, for, for ecosystems. And so um, FIPS, forest insects and pathogens, can also cause uh, major impacts to ecosystem services. If we think about the removal of a particular tree species um, within a region, for example, species B here, this yellow one, is uh, being removed by some pest or disease, and then after recovery, it might struggle to recover um, within the ecosystem. And so this could potentially lead to um, changes in ecosystem services, things like uh, water um, cycling, uh, water quality uh, within a region. And so um, this is an area where there's been a lot of thought with respect to adaptation policies and planning and management to try to think about how to um, predict and potentially intervene in order to maintain um, ecosystem services during and after these uh, disturbances within forests. FIPS, uh, forest insects and pathogens, also have complex interactions with other disturbances such as climate change. This was um, a study that, that was a, a meta-analysis review looking at the interactions among um, insects and pathogens, so biotic drivers of disturbance, with abiotic drivers like fire, drought, wind, and snow and ice. And they found that um, the interactions with insects and pathogens and climate change are complex where there can be um, negative dampening interactions, mixed or no interaction effects, or um, sometimes positive or amplifying effects um, with climate change. And so um, this is an area that really warrants um, future study and um, really needs, it creates a need for us to be able to look at both um, climate change effects and these disturbance effects together to really understand um, the net impacts of these, these types of disturbances in forests. And so if we think about um, how forest insects and pathogens impact trees, they're primarily herbivores, they are causing um, stress within trees through their herbivory. And so um, this is a conceptual figure from uh, a paper that thought about these compound and interacting effects of um, stress within trees, and this shows sort of a death spiral um, of trees as a result of this, this aggregate impact of stress from all these different sources. And so this was a, a, a paper that suggested, uh, as has been suggested in the literature for a long time, it's rarely any one thing that kills a tree, but rather the aggregate burden of stress that that tree experiences um, through both biotic and abiotic factors. And so um, when we're thinking about um, the role of FIPS at, at a large scale within the Earth system and in the carbon cycle, forests and sex and pathogens are um, ecologically, economically important. They have these complex interactions with climate change, but they're not represented in most Earth system models. Um, and this is, has historically been um, due to, to thinking about like the, the sheer number of the different types of insects and pathogens. It would be hard to build thousands of different species um, into an Earth system model to understand um, the, the, the potential impacts of that of a huge volume of different types of species. Uh, but we do know that FIPS can interact with climate change and other stressors, um, and there have been a few case studies that implemented specific FIPS, but generally bark beetles that kill trees really quickly and cause um, really short-term mortality, where um, when they've, they've been implemented within her system models, um, the model said, okay, these, all these trees are dead now, um, rather than implementing a source of, of slow stress within the system. 
And so uh, this sort of ties into this ecological forecasting framework, which I'm sure that some of you have heard about before. Uh, this was a paper by Dietz et al. in, in 2018. Um, they tried to make the case for um, a greater role of forecasting within ecological systems. And so if we think about um, sort of, the, if we start all the way at the left here, the scientific method cycle, where we create a hypothesis, build models, and create a forecast of how, of how a system might change in the future, we can use that forecast together with more observations to feed back into our models. And, and create this iterative forecast cycle, like for a weather forecast where we get new data, update our, up, update our forecast for the next day based on our new data. And so um, they argue in this paper we should be doing the same thing with our ecological data, taking in these new data sources and updating our predictions as more um, and new data come online. And um, this is something that I'll cycle back to at the end, but there's um, a lot of opportunity for thinking about the interaction between these iterative forecast cycles and things like adaptive management, where people have to make decisions about some action based on the best information at hand. And this we can think about, again, our analogy to our weather forecast. We're all making decisions about what we do in a particular day or whether or not we bring a jacket based on the best information um, at a particular time. When we think about adaptive management, that's thinking about making a decision based on the best scientific information about how some process um, is going to change in the near-term future. And so this is just a, a quick plug for this Ecological Forecasting Initiative. If you're interested in forecasting, ecoforecast.org. Um, there are workshops, resources um, at that site where you can um, learn more about forecasting. Okay, so um, the quick outline for the talk. Um, first of all, I'm gonna talk about how um, we represented forest insects and pathogens as functional types that are connected to plant carbon pathways within our system models. So a framework for building in that huge biodiversity um, down into a few functional types that can be tractable within an earth system model. Um, and then the, the next part, I'm gonna talk about um, this, this eco-informatic framework that can connect FIPS data with an ecosystem model to look at the impacts of um, these two examples. First, an unexpected regional invasive caterpillar eruption um, within northeastern forests. And secondly, um, two species specific FIPS um, with different sort of modes of operation, one really fast, one really slow, um, into a novel site where um, they haven't, haven't existed before. Okay, so first off, um, this, this functional framework for FIPS. And so I mentioned there's a huge diversity of different types of insects and pathogens, and it's impossible to build every one into an Earth system model. But if we back up and think about from um, the plant's perspective, because this is sort of how the, the herbivores are impacting the plant carbon flows, um, they operate through um, about five sets of different types of mechanisms. And so if we think about what FIPS are doing within the plant carbon pools, we have flow of feeders that are sipping out carbon that was recently fixed by GPP photosynthesis. And so they're taking out some of this fresh um, photosynthate before it can go to the plant um, storage pool. We have xylem disruptors, uh, things like bark beetles, that are cutting off some of this transpiration flow by burrowing through the bark and, and sort of cutting off the xylem of the tree. We have things like defoliators that are removing uh, the leaf biomass pool, and um, things like stem rocks and root rocks that are increasing uh, the turnover um, of trees from, from the, the sort of more trees falling down if they're, if they're structurally compromised from stem rots, and then increased um, turnover within the root pools. Um, if the roots are rotting, the trees need to keep rebuilding the roots over and over because of a fungal pathogen. And so um, in, this, in this work, uh, we argue that these five, these five functional categories um, capture most insects and pathogens in their impacts on plants. And so if we're trying to model these from a carbon perspective, this helps to group insects and pathogens into these different types. And um, our hypothesis in this work is that these different types are gonna help to capture a more realistic range of stress to mortality uh, within forest trees. And so um, in order to um, understand whether this functional representation worked, 
Uh, we did a proof of concept study where we worked with a really simple ecosystem model. It was basically this cartoon tree, um, but with equations for the arrows. And so not a complex ecosystem, just a really simple um, plant carbon pool uh, model. We ran this really simple ecosystem model within a single species pine stand. Um, this is the Metolius flux site, um, which is a uniform aged um, single species pine stand in Oregon. And we cycled one year of climate data um, for four years. So we were looking at no differences in um, climate variability over that time period. And over this, uh, with this simple model and this simple stand, the simple climate data, we simulated these different FIPS classes, so these five functional classes and the impacts on the forest stand. And so um, what did we find? The, in all of these graphs, the gradient from blue is light stress, and then red is high stress. We looked at um, increasing 10% increments of FIPS intensity. And this is showing um, the, the impacts on these three functional types, flow impeders, xylem disruptors, and defoliators, on the leaf carbon pools and the storage carbon pools within the tree. Those are like the tree's reserves to be able to um, draw and to recover from stress and over this four year time period. And so uh, we can see from, from looking at these, these gradients, we start to see sort of thresholds and breakpoints between recovery. So in these um, like blue, the, the blue areas where the tree can kind of keep growing even though it's experiencing some stress, all the way to mortality if we think about these red lines kind of dropping off. And uh, we're also, excited in this initial simple, simple modeling study to see that these different um, classes, these different functional types of FIPS um, kind of matched up with some observations that we see um, from different types of FIPS in the field. For example, defoliators, trees can usually recover if they're defoliated one year in a row. We'll talk a lot more about that um, in the first example. Whereas things like xylem disruptors, um, things like bark beetle can experience really rapid mortality um, if the xylem flow is cut off. And so we, we see uh, what we think of as sort of realistically wide ranges of impacts to plant carbon pools from recovery to, to depletion. Um, because like I mentioned, the, the models that have incorporated these effects so far assume instant, instantaneous mortality of the trees. But trees, trees can be resilient, they can recover from stresses. And so um, with this simple model, we also saw, saw some interesting um, indirect ecosystem feedbacks. For example, um, feedbacks to root biomass within the model. Even though root biomass wasn't directly changing from any of these three um, uh, functional groups, we could see the sort of decline in root biomass, which could lead to things like moisture stress and lead to things like this death spiral, like the, the conceptual diagram of thinking about this feedback from stress uh, from multiple causes and the aggregate impacts of that stress um, towards mortality. We also saw, if we look at the rates of mortality, the, the rates and thresholds of stand level mortality, so now scaling up to sort of the whole forest, um, also map up um, with sort of expectations based on observations and field data um, from things like flow feeders and xylem disruptors to defoliators, which are more likely to recover. Okay, um, so this was our, our sort of first test of these functional groups uh, within, again, this really simple model and a simple ecosystem with a simple climate. Um, so the next step after um, developing this functional framework was to build it into a dynamic vegetation model that represents, um, more accurately represents um, the composition, competitive demography, um, forest structure, um, and the interactions between um, the ecosystem and the atmosphere. And I call this framework with the functional groups uh, disturbed. Um, we call this this model the ED model. Um, so this is this extension to the functional um, fix is disturbed. And so um, I'm briefly going to um, give a, a short overview of, of kind of the pieces of the end model and how they fit together, and then I'll talk about um, the first uh, sort of example of this work. So within the ED2 model, 
It represents patches on the landscape that are within some bigger site. And so this whole box is a site within the Ed model, and these patches um, within the site share soil texture and meteorology. So they're having the same um, weather inputs, and they share um, soil texture type as well. These, spatial, these, these different patches are capturing different times since disturbance across that, across that landscape of the site. So for example, um, this site has been harvested, so there are no trees um, left in that site. Or excuse me, within that patch. Within the patches, we have cohorts of trees. Um, these are plant functional types of similar size and age class. And so for example, within patch two here, we have one, two, three, and four cohorts. That's what's represented by these um, our two block trees. And then these different cohorts um, have plant functional types, PFTs, that represent sets of tree species with similar traits and successional trajectories. So for example, within the Ed model, um, early hardwoods is a, is a plant functional type uh, of trees. And so uh, within ecosystem modeling, uh, we do this because similarly to we can't represent every single insect and pathogen that exists, we can't represent every single tree, species of tree that exists. And so in order to uh, make the models tractable, we have to simplify them into these classes where they share similar traits that influence um, things like their growth rates um, and exchange of carbon, water, and energy with the atmosphere. And so uh, these, these PFT cohorts within the patch then are the level um, at which they exchange um, carbon, water, and energy with the atmosphere. So the plants are taking up carbon um, and then releasing carbon to the atmosphere. Um, same with water and energy. And then uh, we have these soil layers that exist within the patch that exchange um, mass and energy with cohorts in the atmosphere as well. Within the model, it's dynamic because these cohorts can grow, they can disperse, they can recruit, and they can die, and they implicitly compete with these other cohorts based on their traits. And so uh, they're, they're competing um, and growing up and um, uh, recruiting and dispersing um, within the model. And so this together simulates the vegetation dynamics. So we talk about the vegetation dynamics as changes in um, composition and structure of the forest. And so um, Ed2 in a nutshell is made up of sites that share meteorology and subsoil attributes. Within sites there are patches that are formed by disturbance that have soil layers. And then within those patches are cohorts of plant functional types of similar size and age class. And all together, this uh, sort of hierarchy of structure um, creates the resulting vegetation dynamics that the model simulates. So again, changes in composition, um, so the PFT composition, um, changes in structure, and changes in the carbon, energy, and water flux uh, with the atmosphere. Any questions about that before I can just give you an idea of the pieces of the model that are interacting. Yeah. When you say a site, what do you <laughs> someone who's completely not in this field, what do you what do you think? Yeah, so usually when we talk the, the, the sites that I'm gonna talk about in the first example are um, tenth of a degree lat long grids. Um, and so if we're running the model um, we can run it sort of at a grid resolution across a region, or we can run it at an individual site as well. And the model actually lets you set up flexible resolution for the size of, of that site. And so the size um, is sort of set by the, the, um, the, the, yeah, in the way that you set up the model. So I guess it's flexible. Is the, is the, yeah. You have soil types in there and topography? Yeah, so there's soil texture, um, yeah, topography to um, slope aspect and elevation. Um, yep. These ones are in there too. Yep. All right. Okay. So um, within this uh, overall disturbance framework, then, we are um, have extended the Ed model to have um, these insect and pathogen types. And within this broader project, we're really trying to connect together these two questions. Um, where are FIPS in the forest? 
Um, so for this, we're using um, remotely sensed imagery, survey data, spread models. Um, with this question, how do FIPS impact the forest? And so this is where we're using the N2 model uh, with these functional classes built in. And so uh, this sort of is a conceptual diagram of how these things all fit together within this um, broader um, eco-informatics system. And so this top piece here is the, are the parts within the N2 model where we have this functional representation of forest insects and pathogens and the resulting changes in ecophysiology, demography, and structure. And then these connect to FIP spread data models and then climate data model scenarios are um, potentially driving, well, definitely driving the model and then potentially driving the, the FIP spread uh, models as well. And so this informatic system sort of holds all these pieces together um, and statistically um, makes them interact with each other. Okay, so the first example um, of uh, how we've applied this modeling framework is uh, with an outbreak of Lymandria dispar, um, the common name is Gypsy Moth, in the northeastern US. Lymandria dispar is a defoliator that prefers oaks. Um, it was introduced to the US in 1869 um, by someone who thought that they would uh, potentially have the next like silkworm industry in the northeastern US, but that didn't work out and the caterpillars have escaped and they have um, since become invasive within uh, northeastern forests. They occur in population eruptions that are really challenging to predict. You can see the time series here of 1920 through present where we get um, really large eruptions. There was a huge one in 1981. But since then, uh, the populations have been kept in check by a fungal pathogen um, that kills the caterpillars. And so the fungal pathogen uh, is pathogen of the caterpillars, with levels of insects and pathogens here. Um, it keeps the populations low, um, generally. There's also a virus that has controlled the caterpillar populations um, since the early 1900s. However, in um, 2015, so it had been a long time since there had been an outbreak of Lymandria dispar um, within the forest, there was a surprise outbreak. We think that this was connected to a, um, a drought, a severe drought that happened in this time. So the fungal pathogen couldn't spread to the caterpillars with the drought. The spores became unviable before they infected the next caterpillar. And so we think that this was connected to um, these, these fungal pathogen dynamics where in drought years, the, the fungal pathogen couldn't kill off the caterpillars, and we had this huge outbreak of um, Lamantra dispar throughout the northeastern US. And so this was a, an unexpected eruption. Um, you can see from this aerial imagery here, this was an image taken in mid-June, it looks like winter time, where all of the leaves have been eaten by these caterpillars um, from the trees. And um, these uh, maps on the, on the bottom here are showing what this looks like from a Landsat defoliation data product so this is a 30 meter spatial resolution, where in 2016, we can see this severe defoliation, um, especially through um, Rhode Island. And then 2017, this really widespread defoliation um, across the region as the, as the population has really started to spread. And so um, we're using the disturb ed framework um, to try to understand the impacts and recovery from um, this Lymantria dispar outbreak. So within a single year, um, in an oak tree, about April to May, the spring leaves flush. So the, the, the tree produces leaves, the caterpillars emerge. They eat all the leaves from the tree. But it isn't over for the tree yet. When the caterpillars pupate, when they turn um, into their next life history stage, trees can draw on this stored carbon and make a second set of leaves. Um, so they can draw on the reserves and flush the second set of leaves and um, sort of try to catch up on photosynthesis for the rest of the growing season. And so within a single year of defoliation, the trees usually survive. They have enough resources to be able to flush leaves twice. However, with several years of repeated defoliation, trees are having to produce two sets of leaves every year. And so our hypothesis is that with repeated defoliation, this is going to deplete the stored carbon within trees and create um, a diminished ability of the forest uh, to be resilient to this disturbance, a diminished ability to recover from this disturbance um, after it happens. And so um, we're also able to look at this impact of repeated defoliation across the region because um, the, as you can see from sort of the satellite imagery, the um, distribution of the, the impacts of this insect are really spatially heterogeneous. They're really patchy across the landscape. 
And so we did have um, lots of sites that were defoliated for no years, one year, two years, or three years in a row, depending on where they were um, in the region. And so we had a wide range of different types of intensities of the, of the um, defoliating insect of, of Lemmetrudis bar, and also of the number of years that the forest was defoliated within these different spots. And so um, our goal in this work was to use this disturbed framework to um, first look at how did the defoliation impact the forest carbon balance. And so in order to do this, we looked at the, um, the model simulations of GPP, gross primary productivity, so total photosynthesis, and NEE, net ecosystem exchange. And so this is the net ecosystem exchange of carbon dioxide between ecosystems in the atmosphere. And so um, after this first question, we're, we also um, have started to look at um, whether the defoliation frequency reduced the resistance and the resilience of these forests um, to disturbance, and whether forest composition helped to explain variation in resistance and, and resilience as well. Okay. So to answer these questions, um, again, we use this disturbed framework where we ran model simulations across the southern New England region so Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, um, starting in 2012, so a few years before the outbreak started, through 2022. So if forecasting a few years out um, after, after this disturbance passed through. And we were connecting together this Landsat defoliation data product um, with the Ed2 ecosystem model. And so we ran baseline scenarios during this time period where we had no defoliation. So that was like thinking about what would have happened if there weren't any caterpillars um, eating all the leaves within these uh, forests during this time period. And then we ran defoliation scenarios which captured reality that included this defoliation data product um, for Lamantra Dispar to, to eat leaves. And so um, just a, a couple of notes about how this um, Landsat data product works. This uses um, the Landsat time series to create a synthetic image. So this is like what we would expect based on the long time series of Landsat uh, data for a particular um, Landsat scene. And then it compares each newly acquired image to this long time series of Landsat data, the synthetic image, and creates a condition score, which is the, the observation, so that's our newly acquired image, minus the prediction, which is our synthetic image. And so it's like thinking about a departure from a long-term mean condition. And so um, with that, that condition score, we get near real-time estimates of um, the impacts of defol defoliation per scene. Um, and this is, this is published in work by my collaborator, uh, Val Pascarella in Forests 2017. Um, so we can see here on June 2nd, there's no defoliation, everything's blue. June 18, we start to see a couple of um, eruptions of populations throughout here, and then by June 26, um, the, po the populations continue to expand um, of defoliators. And so we get these near real-time um, estimates of defoliation, and then we aggregate these near real-time esti estimates together to a seasonal product. So there's a seasonal data product um, from, from these near real-time estimates, because we have things like clouds and not every seed is perfect. Um, and so we aggregate those together as well. And so um, this gives you uh, a sense of what this looks like. And so this, these dots are data. The red line is the synthetic image model. And then this is showing an example of a year that was defoliated where the observations depart from the predictions for that model. And so it's showing this drop in greenness that's associated um, in this case with, with defoliation. So in order to um, run this model, we're also using um, initial conditions from the U.S. Forest Service um, Forest Inventory and Analysis Plot data and meteorology inputs from NLDAS2, which are a meteorology data product. Um, in order to forecast out to 2022, we recycled non-drought years as sort of a conservative best case estimate um, if the forest doesn't have another drought during this time period. Um, and Sarah Russell, um, one of the students that I mentioned who was really involved with this work, helped to, to aggregate all these things together and um, get the, the end model um, to work with them. And so um, this gives you a, a sort of picture of, of what this looks like within the model, where we have the years 2015 to 2018, and then the Landsat defoliation data product is um, 
Modulating LAI, the leaf area index within the model. So this describes the amount of leaf area per area of ground surface. And so we can see in the baseline simulations, um, in black here, this is, these are the non-defoliated uh, simulations. Um, LAI is high during the growing season. And then in our defoliation scenarios, we get this um, strong defoliation of the caterpillars um, that's modulated again by the intensity of defoliation from that Landsat pixel. And so it's reducing LAI um, until the caterpillars can move on, and then the trees can recover and flush a second set of leaves for the, for the rest of the growing season. And so this is changing the leaf area index based on the Landsat defoliation data product. So if we look at um, this, this first question, how did defoliation impact forest carbon balance? Again, we're going to look at um, GPP, um, gross carbon productivity, and NEE, net ecosystem exchange. Um, this is showing a lot of things at once. These different lines are showing um, each site trajectory within the model. And then these, the, the thick lines are showing the, the model um, ensemble mean across the region. And so this is showing sites that were defoliated for one year in blue, two years in sort of this yellow orange, and then three years in a row in red. And we're looking at this time series. So time is on the x-axis. And then the proportion of baseline GPP is on the y-axis. So this is looking at the, refra the fraction of GPP in the defoliation scenario divided by the GPP in the baseline scenario. So this is like thinking about how far did the defoliation scenario depart from the baseline scenario that had no defoliation. So it's kind of like an impact of severity um, compared to these baseline conditions. So we can see when we look at GPP that sites that were defoliated one or two years were mostly recovered or heading, heading towards recovery by 2022. However, sites that had three years of repeat defoliation had this longer trajectory of GPP recovery. We see um, similar patterns when we look at any A within the model, so that sites were that were defoliated one or two years in a row were relatively resistant to any impacts with the net carbon cycle. Um, there is relatively little change um, in net ecosystem exchange. So here we're looking at zero is, is um, carbon neutral with the atmosphere. Negative numbers mean um, a carbon sink from the atmosphere. Positive numbers, a carbon source to the atmosphere. So these uh, temperate northeastern forests are um, usually a carbon sink from the atmosphere. They're taking up more carbon than they're releasing. Um, and this, this remains the case for sites that were defoliated for one or two years in a row. Uh, but sites, again, sites that were defoliated for three years in a row push closer to this um, being a carbon source to the atmosphere. Um, although the, the model ensemble mean still is like slightly below, below zero. And so when we, when we aggregate this up to um, the regional scale, um, compared to baseline, this reduced regional GPP by about 18% over a decade. So if we look at the decadal scale, and it increased regional NEE by about 20% uh, over this decade. Um, but again, these forests mostly remained carbon sinks from the atmosphere, despite this relatively large disturbance um, to the system. Okay, so that was um, thinking about how did this impact the, the carbon balance. We also looked at resistance and resilience of the system, and across this, these different sites that we um, were using to model this um, impact. And so there are, there are a lot of different ways to measure um, resistance and resilience. When, when we're looking at um, resistance within this work, we're thinking about the absolute magnitude of a decline of some ecosystem process like GPP in response to a disturbance. So this is like how far did the system get pushed after that disturbance? How far, what was the, what was the maximum um, change that that system experienced in response to some disturbance? And we think about resilience as the rate of recovery following a disturbance. So how quickly does that system move back towards whatever state it was in um, prior to the disturbance? And so for resilience, we're thinking about a recovery rate following a disturbance. And so when we look at this resistance metric, so how, how far does the system get pushed 
we see um, this is a decline in GPP, so this is negative, this is a loss of GPP. For one year of defoliation, there is a relatively small loss of GPP from the system, but for uh, two or three years, there was a, a much wider spread and more density in, in a stronger decline in GPP. And we see parallel patterns if we think about the increase in NEE. So this is, again, the push towards that system being a source of carbon to the atmosphere, where with one year of defoliation, the system um, experiences a smaller push, though with two or three years, we start to get a larger um, increase in, in NEE. Although, I mentioned that there still is a lot of variation among the sites within, within this region. What, what is that caused by? So you have like the two humps with the one, is that species present in the cohort? Yeah, like in, I'm going to uh, talk about some of it is um, related to basal area of oaks with the mop Yeah, yeah, or, or different um, species. Um, yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, if you have more questions about it, I'm happy to talk more about that too. Okay. Um, so for, for resistance, we see this kind of sorting depending on the number of consecutive years of defoliation. So with one year of defoliation, the system is um, more resistant than with more years of defoliation, it's less resistant, it gets pushed further. We don't see this clear sorting when we look at recovery rates from the system. So there isn't a clear sorting of these sites based on the number of years of defoliation, Sort of whether the sites were defoliated one, two, or three years, they have different recovery rates, and it doesn't explain well um, the recovery rates from, from this disturbance. And so, still investigating um, that. So, one thing um, that we that we looked at um, with respect to kind of explaining variation in this um, resistance metric was the amount of oak basal area within the plots. So this describes uh, the size and abundance of oak trees within the plots. Oaks are the preferred host for lime tree in this part, um, although they will eat other things, um, they're, the, they're the primary um, host. And so when we look at oak basal area, we see that for, for, for plots that were defoliated one or two years, that plots that had more oaks were more resistant to this change. They experienced a smaller decline in GPP um, in response to this disturbance. However, when we see sites that were defoliated three years in a row, this flips the relationship so that large trees start to die from this disturbance when we, when we bridge up to three consecutive years of defoliation, where sites that had um, a lot of large oaks um, experienced a um, stronger decline in GPP um, with this disturbance. And so this might suggest sort of a threshold where um, Large trees are resistant to one or two years of disturbance, but then with three years, it sort of pushes them over the threshold um, towards mortality. Again, the um, recovery rates, when we look at resilience um, with respect to oak basal area, the relationship um, is much more variable. We see a positive relationship with one year of defoliation, where um, Plots with larger trees had faster recovery rates, but for two or three years, there's no relationship between the recovery rates um, and uh, oak basal area. And so we think this is, we're, we're continuing to investigate whether other uh, metrics of composition um, might help to explain some of these patterns as well. Uh, but we started by looking at the, the sort of density of, of the host tree and the size of the, of the host tree within um, the plots. Okay. I'm going to um, connect to talking about um, some impacts of this um, limit of the limitary dispar um, eruption on ecohydrology. Um, so this was work by um, Sarah Smith Tripp, who was a senior honors thesis student um, at Wellesley this 2018-2019. This, uh, and um, she was looking at the, the connections uh, with, with ecohydrology and water within the system where her hypothesis was that defoliation will reduce evapotranspiration through the trees, um, causing higher runoff and stream flow in summertime. Evapotranspiration is the primary flux of water out of northern temperate forests during the growing season, and so if that water is not coming um, out of the leaves, it, it's likely that it could be um, running off and creating higher stream flows. And so in order to investigate this, um, she looked at the impact of regional defoliation on watershed scale, um, water yield, so the total amount of water coming out of the system, and streamflow characteristics, 
So whether students were having high flows, medium flows, or low flows, at um, 102 street pages throughout the, the Northeastern um, network of um, street pages. And so um, she used the same Landsat defoliation data product to quantify defoliation severity within the watersheds, and then um, assessed changes in yield and stream flow relative to a 15 to 20 year baseline for the stream gauges, for each stream gauge within, within the region. And so uh, this shows sort of the same, the same patterns of the Landsat imagery, but now at the watershed scale, where each of these polygons is showing a watershed in the Northeast, where we have um, the severe defoliation for Rhode Island and Connecticut in 2016, and then this widespread defoliation um, in 2017, and um, recovery in 2018. So um, 2016 was also the year that was um, an extreme drought in the Northeast as well. And you'll see this in the, the yield and stream flow data. And the defoliation was most widespread in 2017. And so um, when Sarah looked at this defoliation metric from the Landsat imagery, so higher numbers or more defoliation, she looked at this in the response of the water yield anomaly. Um, and so this is the, the comparison of water yield in that season, we looked at the growing season water yield only, to the, the 15 to 20 year baseline. So it was like looking at how different was that year compared to this 15 to 20 year baseline. And so she found that in um, 2016, these yellow years, um, there was a positive relationship where sites that were defoliated more had a lower water yield anomaly in the drought. And so there was more water coming out in streams uh, sort of despite the drought within the region. And there was also a positive relationship in 2017 um, when the, the um, defoliation was widespread. This relationship um, existed even when we accounted for um, sort of regional differences in precipitation. Um, among sites within the, within the region too. And so um, defoliation increased seasonal water meal in sites that were um, heavily defoliated. Not by much, but like if we look at the scale here, um, 100 millimeters, but we're able to kind of pull out this positive relationship um, with the growing season yield. Um, she also looked at how defoliation changed the magnitude of different um, stream flow types um, so high flows, medium flows, and low flows within the instantaneous stream flow values across this um, gauge network. And so um, she did this by looking at um, flow duration curves, um, of sort of the frequency with which a stream experiences some value of flow. So flow is on the y-axis, and the fraction of time that flow is exceeded is on the x-axis. And so for example, for this 0.25, this means that, that this stream flow value, um, that, that the stream experiences a value higher than this value 25% of the time. And so for 50%, the stream experiences a value higher than that 50% of the time. So it's like a way of looking at the probability of different magnitudes of flow events for that particular stream. And so again, with the um, sort of instantaneous stream flow, she saw a positive relationship um, in 2016, and then a strong positive relationship in 2017, particularly for increased high flow um, values within these streams. So these streams had more water coming out, and they were coming out in higher um, extreme flow events within um, the related sites. Okay. So um, some next. Next steps for this work, um, we're working on incorporating um, survey data from the Plavin Reservoir. Um, this was a large effort by um, a REU team that we had this past summer and had a, another thesis student who's starting to look at the role of nitrogen in predicting um, defoliation and recovery from a major discard. I'll wrap up by talking about um, this last example of a different um, set of insects and pathogens that we're also trying to um, use this framework to understand. And this is um, uh, two invasive insects that are about to move into the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. And so Hubbard Brook uh, is a place where vegetation dynamics have been measured for a long time. Um, and there are novel disturbances acting on this legacy of long-term data at the site. Um, and in particular, there are two invasive insects, the hemlock willia delgin and the emerald ash borer, that are um, very likely to move with the, into the forest within the next um, 10 to 20 years 
and to um, start to cause mortality within hemlock trees and ash trees within the forest. These have different time scales of mortality. The hemlock really adelgid is more like a slow press of stress within those, those um, trees towards eventual mortality. And the emerald ash borer is, is um, really quick. And this is because they represent different functional groups within um, this framework. So um, hemlock woolly adelgid is a phloem feeder. It's sitting there uh, sipping out photosynthate. And um, ash borer is a xylem disruptor. So it's cutting off the xylem flow really fast. And so this also brings in two new examples for, for testing um, this framework. And so in order to do this, we are drawing on um, long-term data from another site at Harvard Forest, uh, which has both of these um, invasive insects. Here's a photo of um, artist uh, at, who's worked at Harvard Forest, um, David Buckley Borden, and his hemlock, ho hemlock hospice um, installation, um, thinking about the artistic angles of, of the decline of hemlock within the region. Um, and Harvard Forest has been infested with these two um, insects for um, about the past five years. And so at, at the Harvard Forest too, they measure, they measure so many things. They measure so many things in response to um, these insects and pathogens. So they have data on carbon flux with the atmosphere, they have data on ecosystem pools, they have data on rates of transformations um, of elements within the ecosystem. And so um, we're trying to combine together this long um, data set at Harvard Forest to try to forecast what's going to happen at Harvard Brook uh, from the, these novel disturbances. And so um, the first step in this work, we are doing naive simulations of these two insects, emerald ash borer and hemlock lily adelgid, um, without the Harvard Forest data. And so this is sort of our before holding in the data. Um, what do we expect to find? And so when we do these naive simulations, here's um, an example from Emerald Dash 4 EAP, where we get this really rapid decline in NPP, but then the system recovers really quickly. And in um, the naive simulations, um, this is because of the compensation from other species and other saplings in the understory that are taking over once these canopy ash die. And so um, there's, a, there's a high likelihood for compensation um, from other species within Emerald Dash 4. But we see the opposite case for hemlock willy adelgid, where we get this long, persistent decline um, in mortality within the system. And um, this is primarily due to the spatial aggregation of hemlock within the forest. Hemlock create really unique microclimates where um, there's not much of an understory um, in the hemlock forest in this area. And so there's a relatively um, low sort of sapling layer and seedling layer to be able to compensate once those hemlock um, start to be stressed um, and eventually die from the hemlock woolly indulgin. And so um, our next steps in this work that we're starting to um, move towards are using the plot inventory and flux data at Harvard Forest um, to constrain the near-term impacts of FIPS um, and then working to take those, those um, data from Harvard Forest and think about applying them um, to forecasting responses at Hubbard Brook, or we're thinking towards can knowing one site very well predict the response at a novel site. All right, so I'll wrap up with some take-home messages. Um, so these functional patterns are helpful in capturing, um, these functional types are helpful in capturing realistic patterns of stress. Um, the invasive caterpillar, the major disbar, causing impact to carbon uptake. Um, where resistance to disturbance was easier to explain than resilience patterns. We're still working on understanding what's controlling resilience. Um, and hopefully this showed that forecasting could potentially bound in future scenarios of impending um, novel disturbances by FIPS. And so uh, again, we're working within this framework of trying to bring together all these pieces of information to better understand the impacts of forest insects and pathogens on um, ecosystem processes, and within this forecasting framework, we're trying to um, better understand what information we need and how to put these pieces together um, to be able to predict um, responses to forest and sex and pathogens. And on that note, um, I'm also collaborating with um, a couple of different groups within the Northeast to try to think about um, this last piece, connecting these forecast um, cycles to adaptive management of the systems. So um, thinking about people that are managing forests, trying to understand um, how and when to harvest um, trees, and to um, think about that within the context of uh, maintenance of ecosystem services within the region as well. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, the funding agencies that support this work, the Macro Systems Biology Program, LTER Network, um, 
and in particular acknowledge the uh, huge teams of scientists that work um, on the PCAN tools, um, Landsat imagery and NLDAS weather data products, and forest inventory and analysis data. There are huge efforts, and I am so grateful to all the people who work at those places and make their data available with use. So with that, uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions at your time. We have some time for questions. Let's open it up to everyone. Anyone who wants to ask? Oh. Yeah. Is there any kind of, um, like, this is cool, so thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Is there any kind of, like, validation of the of the model that the model yeah. framework? So I haven't read those papers. I'll just admit that up front. But, the, you know, what the model predicts to happen. Yeah, so we're working on that now, um, primarily with the, um, the data that we're collect we collected this past summer. Um, where did it go? The, this, this data from around the Quantum Reservoir. So there are um, a lot of neon plots there, and we also set up a bunch of plots around the Quabbin um, to monitor the um, mortality rates within the area. So we're going to have um, validation data for uh, mortality, um, and then my colleague, I work with um, Bob Baby at Connecticut um, on getting, he did um, some, oh my God. <laughs> not, not like a full on tree core, but the little uh, push core uh, to get to get growth reduction within the past um, few years as well. And he has a network of sites too, working on um, validation of mortality rates too. Um, in that area of Connecticut, um, he's at Community Com, um, experienced uh, really severe mortality in some sites. So we're trying to use um, field data to, um, yeah, validate the, the model responses. Yeah. Okay, really cool stuff. Um, a couple of different questions, but just want to start. So why does that GPP effect so long? If it's a one-year event where they where they get a hit, but then it's supposed to be this multi-year effect of GPP. I think we to understand why it persists over a longer time period. Yeah. So from so especially some of those plots that had um, three years of defoliation, some of that is mortality. And so mortality of the trees and then this live tree growth response um, within those sites. Um, something that we're trying to um, pull out um, and disentangle from the modeling results too is that some of the forests are more sort of coastal oak pine forests and some are more sort of inland oak hickory forests. And so we're trying to kind of understand um, in particular the role of um, drought stress on those trees because the, the, the oak pine are going to be in the sandier spots where they're probably also feeling the drought stress more um, than in those sites. Yeah. Great, thanks. And, and another question is, um, you're focusing right now on like, is it cute or good where you're living in yes. okay. But it's also sort of on for where you're yeah. so getting eaten all the time by insects and deer and everything else. So is that just kind of a background process in that in terms of, you know, that's not explicitly represented in yeah, no, I think it's not, it's not a, I mean, it's not a background process. I would say it's like implicitly incorporated in like the data that go into Ed because we just can't separate out those effects, I think, from, from experimental data. Um, but yeah, so I think it's like embedded within the data that have been used to develop and, and constrain the Ed model and, and all of the traits that we measure and things like that uh, that kind of feed into it. So. Yeah, you know, I think that's interesting specifically with, um, Hemlock, when we adult it, I feel like, at least here in, in the you know, central woods, I feel like it's a competition between deer and hemlock more than anything else in the other story. So I'm curious, like, how that framework could be adapted to include these kind of multiple stressor impacts. Yeah, we could totally include deer yes. <laughs> in these, yes. these yeah, impacts. Deer, deer are herbivore, <laughs> not an insect, but yeah, larger herbivore, and kind of taking out those, those cohorts. Yeah. 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 I was wondering. <laughs> You were talking about the um, uh, new properties of the trees themselves and that, how that depends upon the soils. And I know that herbicides that are transported in the atmosphere can get into the soil and really have a major impact on the mycorrhizae and other things that are feeding the trees. And I'm wondering, is there any kind of monitoring of the soils or the, uh, the trees in terms of perhaps uh, Pesticide exposures are coming from agricultural regions? That's a really good question. I do not know the answer. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, but I'm not sure. 